Bedema. I'm one of the reporters uh, at Tortoise. Um, and this is a relatively new sort of format of thinking that we've been trying out at Tortoise um, called Making Sense With. And uh, today we're hoping to make sense of Web3. Um, and that's because these thinkings, they're meant to focus on a subject that's really got us sort of in knots, um, something that's really worth thinking about but is not easy to unpick um, and that we think might have some pretty big implications for society, for um, the economy, and also I think interestingly in this case for the way that we do journalism. Um, and the thing that also really interests me about Web3 um, and we'll get into this, is how sort of extremely divided opinion is on the subject. Um, and I'm very lucky that we've got some people who have been thinking about this for much longer than I have. Um, firstly, in the room, uh, Stephen Deal, who's a, a programmer. Um, but I can't really leave it at that because that doesn't quite explain why you're here. Um, <laughs> Stephen's become a, a very sort of prominent voice in discussing and trying to educate people, I suppose, about Web3 and its sort of constituent parts, um, cryptocurrencies, currencies in quotation marks, NFTs, DAOs, blockchain, um, all of the kind of subject matter for this talk. Um, and has become, I, I don't know if renowned is the right word, <laughs> um, pretty, pretty well known for doing so. And um, is a, a, a person I massively value opinion, uh, Stephen. So thank you for joining us. We're also joined by uh, David Gerard, um, who's here remotely, um, the author of The Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain um, and, and, and Libra Shrug. Well, we laugh. It's a, there's there's a, a, a very, very serious uh, driver, I guess, behind David's work, which has been to call out and try to explain some of the kind of sweeping issues with the way that blockchain technology is talked about um, and some of the uh, I get it's the fraud and deception um, and the inefficiencies in the way that um, some of the technologies in Web3 work. And finally, to Joffrey Huntley, um, who is joining us very kindly in the middle of the night from the other side of the world um, to talk about this subject, Web3. He's, he's also a software engineer um, and the creator of NFT Bay, which was uh, a performance art piece. I'll, I'll give him the chance to talk about it, certainly, but a very, very interesting piece of commentary on Web3 and the way that it is sort of working in the world. Um, and we're also very lucky to have this sort of intimate group of people here um, to, to talk about this, because uh, this is still a tortoise thinking. I'd love to hear what people think, questions um, for Stephen, for Joffrey, for, for David are uh, allowed in this context um, because I think with making sense of, we've all got questions and we want answers. So um, please do sort of put your hand up, just catch my eye and anyone uh, else who's joining in the chat, please just put your, your thoughts there um, and I will keep an eye on them. Um, just final thing for me is this is sort of feels a bit like the end of a series of thinkings that I, I've done where we've as a newsroom been trying to get to the bottom of what's happening with cryptonomics and I'd love to kind of put a, a rubber stamp on our view as it were because that investigations involved everything from like conspiracy theories about the global finance system and this kind of pseudo religious view that crypto is the future and um, a lot of skepticism also about kind of what happened in 2008 and the financial crash and whether the global financial system is fit for purpose um, and had also a lot of acronyms that I've sort of just about managed to get, get my head around. Um, so I'm really glad we've got this group together. Um, and I wanted to, to start, and I think this might be a good question for David, to, to start by asking something that my colleague Marks and Andrew asked when we were talking about this thinking, was like, if we're gonna bang on about Web3, can we actually just start with Web2? Um, and what that is, we're still in Web2 now, as it were, and then we'll maybe use that as a bit of a springboard to define the concept of Web3 and hopefully pick it apart. So I don't think the ideas have anything to do with each other. Web3 is a marketing buzzword. Basically, it's telling you of an exciting 
exciting new way to buy crypto magic beans claiming they're worth money. So they picked, we'll do the next one, Web3, and we'll use this term. It doesn't mean it's got anything to do with it because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's the short answer. Yeah. And so uh, Web2, did people talk about Web2 before they were talking about Web3? No. no. Um, Web2 was basically saying, it was trying to explain things like websites that worked like applications at first, like Gmail. Then it eventually became the thing where basically everyone was all on four or five websites and what they posted were screenshots from the other four, you know. Um, it, the thing about Web3 is it was always a marketing term for Ethereum blockchain in the first place. And it was really adopted in mid-2021 by venture capital firms desperately trying to promote crypto. This is all marketing. This is absolutely a seller push, not anything that actually shows much evidence at all of interest from the public. Yeah. If you think of it as a great big PR push, you'll have it correctly modeled. So, so what, are the, um, what are the ideas in that ad campaign, as it were? Like what, what are the key things that people who are pushing Web3 say? It's the same promotion about cryptocurrency since Bitcoin. Bitcoin, altcoins, ICO tokens, DeFi, and now NFTs and Web3. The whole thing is, it's a push that you can get rich for free. Now, if you say that to someone, they'll know that get rich quick schemes don't exist. So this one is get rich for free, but we've got some technological hand waving. And they go, oh, technology, I guess that must be it. Um, I'm literally a technologist, as Stephen is. We can tell you the technology doesn't actually do anything. 100% of the story is people and the flows of cash, specifically from your pocket to their pocket. That's what this is all about. Web3 is a push by venture capitalists who try to get you upset about the big four or five websites, um, and they promise you your freedom, but actually they want to be the big guys instead. That's how it works. It's about the money. It always is. David, I, I, I want to talk about um, the people who are either in search of that money or already have it, because it, it, whether you go on what I've come to think of as sort of crypto Twitter, which is this kind of hive of Twitter where there seems to be an eternal beef going on um, between people like you, Stephen, and, and David, um, and what I've learned you call either sort of Bitcoin maximalists, some people call them boosters, a, and a booster is someone who just wants to see the market grow and, and more money get sucked into it. Um, you, it feels to me, David, like you're saying people are sold on this marketing pitch and they are trying to sell other people on this marketing pitch. But if we could get to the people, who's actually building Web3? Oh, like arguably, who are there people arguing that I'm like, they're building Web3 and what, what are they building? So I think we have to keep in mind that most of the stuff does not exist, all right? It doesn't exist. Um, we, the one bit we have is maybe NFTs which are basically a piece of paper with a number on it and a web page address written on the piece of paper. Implement that as token on a blockchain, you sell people receipts for art and claim it's the art. That's the only bit that actually works. And that market is, we can go into more detail later as to why that market is basically uh, fake. So you have people promoting a sort of incoherent morass of concepts like we'll have a virtual reality the metaverse i think that somehow the entire tech press has forgotten that second life ever existed you know a virtual world that was actually a pretty cool fun game and people still play it but literally the same tech hype happened in 2007 2008 about second life you know ibm was setting up corporate headquarters inside second life even I mean, that all, all that shut down and now Second Life is overrun by furries and they're having a great time. But there's a sort of deliberate marketing amnesia going on where people pretend that nothing about this stuff ever happened before. Um, and they sell you stuff that, if it does exist, it's terrible. Mm. Like that promo for Facebook's metaverse world working, 
the sort of virtual reality that should have been a Zoom call that should have been an email. Yeah. You go, who wants this? Nobody wants it. It's completely seller driven. It's because companies would like to sell you this thing, not because anyone actually wants it. Yeah. Um, it's but the actual thing that the venture capitalists are selling is tokens. Mm. Um, they run schemes to incentivize people to start crypto tokens. These crypto tokens would, I'm not a US securities lawyer, but quite a lot would constitute unregistered offerings of securities, which get you in trouble with the SEC. Right. Um, they promote these by offering masses of money to these companies issuing these tokens. The company issues the tokens. All of the investor laws in the US are to protect investors from token issuers. So the VCs buy the tokens. If the company does not get busted, the VC makes a bundle. If the company does get busted, well, the evil issuer has to give the poor investor all their money back so the VC doesn't lose. It's a sort of gig economy of securities violations. Mm. It's that, that is actually the business of Web3. As I said, it's all about people in the flows of cash, all the other talk, the claims of freedom, the claims of hypothetical fabulous futures that don't exist, yeah. and so on. It's all just marketing for the bit where these guys make a bundle of cash or hope to make a bundle of cash. The money David. basically... Sorry, yeah. Because <laughs> I, cause I do want to, um, I just want to back, backtrack a little bit to the first thing you said, which is, um, for, forgive me if I heard you wrong, but if there was one thing that had sort of been built of Web3, it was NFTs. Um, yeah. And uh, Joffrey, uh, we won't have a better chance than right now to ask you about NFT Bay. Um, and I wonder if you can uh, stay awake. <laughs> Um, could you could you talk to us about what you did and what you think it meant? And then I'd love to go to Giles if he, he's, he's opting out. Okay, uh, Joffrey, t tell us what NFT Bay was um, and why you did it. Sure, yeah. Um, I'd like to also uh, echo what uh, David Gerard is saying here. Um, the definition of Web3 already existed and engineers are really pissed that essentially a bunch of people are looking for liquidity for their tokens are, are basically coming up with this new marketing technique to push people in and uh, to create the liquidity for them. They've, they've co-opted the term that Web3 already had a definition. Um, and one of the ways we, we see this is specifically in NFTs. Uh, so an NFT is depends on how you uh, how you describe it. Um, so I created this little web page called uh, the NFT Bay. It was a bit of a performance art piece and it was uh, modeled after the Swedish Pirate Bay. Uh, there was already a whole bunch of memeing going on online and that I just like, I stole your monkey. Like I, I was able to, why would I buy something on the blockchain? Like when I can just, like it's on my screen, I could just right click save as. So there was this bit of a cultural brewing online and social media about like what has value? Is it the monkey or is it the record on the blockchain? So uh, I came up with this idea, like what happens if I just like, make a claim that I download them all. And so I created the Pirate Bay for uh, all the NFTs and put together this massive 15 terabyte uh, uh, torrent. And the funny thing there is uh, the contents of the torrent wasn't actually uh, the monkeys. It was actually the raw blockchain data. And that's a little bit meta um, and I'll get into it because to understand the cultural conflict, some people will say that the record on the blockchain, the NFT, the actual the piece of data on the blockchain is what has value, the receipt has value. Where other people were saying, well, no, it's the actual monkey, uh, the actual image that has value. Uh, if you want to get a little bit more deeper into this, there is a art, conceptual artist called Ryder Rips right now, uh, really exploring this space. What he's done is he's taken the Board 8 Yacht Club and he's reminted every single or recreated every single Board 8 Yacht Club and the way that NFTs typically work is because the uh, because of the cost for storing uh, storing the data, the actual image isn't stored on the blockchain. It's normally a link to a web page. So what Ryder Rips has done now is he's recreated the NFTs, and he's essentially created duplicate NFTs linking to the same original image as the original image as the original NFTs. And this is. Uh, very, very interesting because it, it's testing some legal challenges as, as like, like 
how do you do a, a takedown on uh, how do you do a takedown on this uh, on blockchain because once it's on or once it's online it's on the blockchain you can't necessarily you can't delete it which is so weird because we get all these brands coming into this space like we're going to commercialize what we're doing with nfts they're going to enable us to do all these cool things but they don't realize someone like Ryder rips can come along anyone can just recreate their their, their nft on on the blockchain uh and it's just it's so so random weird joffrey so so um it's so interesting i i'm conscious though that this is so this is called making sense of and um yeah. i'd love to make sense of what you've just said because i i like i've been no sure. don't get me wrong i i've been looking at this kind of carefully for a while and i'm still like so pirate bay you mentioned was a it was a it was a site for illegally downloading films and games and stuff and you would download them it's a yes using tor using torrenting right correct so and pirate bay is a well-known cultural thing uh around the world for a place that you go to download illegal uh movies torrents whatever using BitTorrent. so nft bay was the idea was well everyone kind of knew what the yeah, what the pirate bay is what happens if someone was to create a website using the same logo same layout same design same like url convention and just instead of people individually saying i download the monkey what if you just said i've downloaded all the monkeys yeah yeah and and so it's, it is very interesting because that last bit you were getting to on calling into question the idea of ownership <laughs> in web three and the, the proof of ownership is essentially what you're doing there by saying, I've created this sort of repository of all of the things that you thought you owned and could prove that you owned and you can't prove that I don't now own them. Is that right? Yeah. So it, it's, uh, I suppose one way to look at this is why would someone buy art in the first place is, is where I'd start. Uh, is people are people dropping millions of dollars just to, for the artwork, or are they dropping millions of dollars for the? Uh, are they dropping millions of dollars for the record on the blockchain, right? And it depends on who you speak with. So I'll quickly get into the the definition of NFT. So there's at least three personas, and this is where you'll get a lot of confusion when you speak to people about NFTs. You have artists. Right. So artists have for a long time had digital art. And if you go to a, a museum right now or any like exhibition, it's all going to be called NFTs. But when you go into that exhibition, no one there has a crypto wallet. There's no NFTs on display. What it actually is, is digital art. Mm. So what's actually happened in that space is the old concept of digital art is now called NFTs. Then if you speak with an engineer such as myself, Gerard or Stephen, we will explain what an NFT is, is essentially a link. Like it's just a, a receipt on the blockchain linking to an image. Now, there are some, there are some NFT projects. Have you ever wondered why they look so pixelated and they're just like crypto punks, they just look like there's no detail to them? That's because of the cost of storage on the blockchain. So some of those, utterly trash and pixel art and the reason they look like that is because the cost is on blockchain so the way they get around that is by linking to an image so the best way to look at it is like that receipt is essentially like a web page that displays an image mm. and then finally the third persona is people who hold cryptocurrency right and so people who hold cryptocurrency they'll advocate that the the reason someone buys an nft is because uh, it's the, the record on the blockchain that has value. Whereas the uh, uh, people who are like the person, the consumer who purchased these NFTs is like, why do I want a receipt? Why, why, do, why does the receipt have value? Um, so you see a lot of marketing push from people from blockchain trying to say that a record on a blockchain is more valuable than it is. It, it does feel like there's a bit of a theme basically across this subject of Web3, which is the repurposing or rebranding of existing or slightly augmented technology with a marketing scheme that involves all of um, these notions about kind of the value going to the moon and the, the inevitable future of money is sort of a phrase that I hear a lot. And I'd love to pick up some of the, 
more of those subjects with you, Stephen, in a moment. But um, Liz, what you, what are you thinking? I hope my question is not going to send us back a bit, but maybe it will. So somebody wrote to us today at Tortoise, a man called Dr. Leonard Anderson. I don't know if that's a famous man or not. And he wrote the following. It to, like, to, you know, to like member help or whatever. Web3 is going to dominate the internet within a decade. So I'd like to understand what that means, because what you're talking about doesn't seem to have much to do with the internet I use all the time for everything in my life. It's a sort of separate thing. So that's, I'm interested in that. Um, and then he goes, the only layer one network with sub-second finality at 100,000 TPS, yeah, <laughs> everybody with me, has been developed by the Convex Foundation, HTTPS colon slash slash convex.world, beta launch next month. Would you guys like to be the first journal to test the claims? Question mark. P.S. Tortoise could generate own label tokens for NFTs for journalistic content, <laughs> micro payments for every viewing. Now, I don't understand any of it, but... I'm interested to know yeah. what that is to do with. So full disclosure, <laughs> full disclosure, I replied to that email. Did you? Yeah, I got it from us and I replied to it and I asked, what do you mean? <laughs> um, I asked, what do you mean? Fairly, because uh, payments per viewing is like an interesting thing that gets talked about yeah. kind of in Web 2, right? And um, uh, I knew that there was this idea that um, transaction times were a problem with blockchain technology, but so just in case, I'm so sorry, Liz, remind me the name of the person. Leonard Anderson. Leonard, in case Leonard is a Anderson is watching, um, it'd be great to he hear from him, but uh, Stephen, what, wh what were you cringing about? <laughs> oh, well, I'm an engineer, and like mm -hmm. I understand what all those words are. That's not the internet I work in either. It's not the word, one internet that me and David and Joffrey work in either. <laughs> like, right. That's the thing about Web3 is that like to go back to the context of this discussion, it is a failure of sense making because Web3 is either a complete marketing buzzword or it is a completely meaningless term that nobody in their right mind can actually tell you what it actually means, right? And it really depends on like the personas on this is. Like if you ask an engineer what Web3 is, they're gonna tell you it's like a load of like marketing rubbish, right? Um, if we talk with the venture capitalists, they're going to tell you that Web3 is a new way of doing fundraising and generating you know, capital raising for their companies, or maybe through securities fraud, I don't know. Um, and you know, if you talk with like, an artist, then this is some sort of new distribution mechanism. And like, nobody can actually make sense of it because Web3 is like this Rorschach test. Like, imagine how mm. you want to reimagine the world's power structures, and you will project whatever you want on top of that. And that's what Web3 has become. Right? It's become this way that no matter what problem you see with the world, Web3 is the answer. And that's not, <laughs> technology can't save us from these things, right? Mm. The problems of the world, right, cannot be solved with technology. And unfortunately, Web3 has become this kind of elaborate myth-making about like this new version of the internet, completely divorced from the reality of the internet that you and I interact with every day, right? And all of those words that the person's talking about are not anything that related to what we do on the internet. And so like, it really is, as David's saying, like it is a marketing buzzword basically to allegedly kind of legitimize cryptocurrencies. Yeah. And that's, that's the sense of it. Okay, so uh, Joffrey's got his hand up, so I'd love to go, go to him and then, I don't, has Anna got the microphone? Amazing. Um, Joff Joffrey, just because your hand's up, I wondered if you wanted to respond to that. Hello. Yeah, um, when we use the word marketing, um, People who have been following this space very closely are aware of at least three different layers. And if you're aware of them, then it kind of, this space kind of makes more sense. So we've, we, we're in a place where over a billion, more, multiple billions of dollars of venture capital has been raised, right? And then we are in a place where we're in a place where social media is about purchase. We see all these uh, celebrities selling out their individual uh, their followers, etc., and there's a lot of promotion. I get a lot of rate cards. Like, if you ever want an idea what rate cards are, I can provide them to you. They, 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 they people just cross promote on social media all the time. Then finally, we have this third tier of community, and this is super strange. So what's what happens is typically when a project is made or something is formed, if it is good, then it goes finds a market, and then and from there you have the market. Money is made, but in this space the market comes first, like the, so what happens is when someone buys an NFT project or they get invested in these tokens, what happens is it corrupts the community. And in, in, in essence, what happens 
is they turn into kind of like a timeshare or homeowners association. So if you're looking at this externally, even as journalists or even just externally, et cetera, what you essentially have is like, you see this huge hype ball, like lots of cash flowing down to people, people getting paid, community members unwilling to actually speak up because if they speak up, then that destroys the equity of the thing that they purchased, even if they know the thing is bad. So we're actually seeing it like corruption all the way down. Um, and a lot of people misplace this, this marketing hype and you don't really get people speaking up that it's, it's bad because it will destroy their holdings. Mm. Thank you. Um, please. Um, I'm not sure if this is actually relevant to conversation right now, but I did a little bit of research before and I knew nothing about this before coming. And the Times actually do a great um, what is Web3 thing. Um, and I looked at it kind of more as like a social structure and it was kind of the idea that, you know, people making their money for playing games through the idea of like getting tokens, things like that. Mm -hmm. You can more as a social interaction where kind of like Black Mirror episode where you have your everything you do is um, on social on Instagram or whatever is um, money towards you. You can you pay your mortgage, everything like that. And it was something that uh, Joffrey said earlier, which was that you can't delete from blockchain. And I was just kind of looking in like that as like what implications that will have moving forward. Mm. And the second question I had was also the idea that um, I know one massive problem is what actually is crypto? Is it an asset or is it commodity, right? So what will take, what will have to happen for it to actually be seen as its own currency and will that ever actually happen? Yeah, I'd love to put this so that I know, Stephen, for a fact, you've got some strong views on that second part and function as a currency. But I, I absolutely very interested in how this is kind of playing out from a social perspective. Um, I don't know, David, the idea that obviously blo blockchain technology is not something you can go back and engineer changes to. Um, do you have a view on whether that makes it even more kind of unfit for purpose if you want to do things like social media or indeed social surveillance using technology? I, I'm very interested in that parallel to, to the kind of indelible mark on your digital identity, as it were. Um, basically oh, gave a oh yeah, it's, it's spectacularly unfit for purpose because like we've had data structures that you can only add new things to since the late 70s. And we've had small systems that had these append-only ledgers distributed since the 90s. They don't have a lot of use cases. They really don't. Um, when the pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto invented Bitcoin, he didn't claim to be inventing new technology. He was basically putting together some existing elements in an interesting new way. And it is really interesting, technically. It's one of those things you sort of look at it and go, wow, that's amazing. But interesting is not the same as feasible or a good idea. Mm. Now, what we have now is cryptocurrency promoters. This literally happened after the 2013 Bitcoin bubble. They went, well, no one likes Bitcoin anymore because the exchange crashed and everyone lost their money and also it's full of drug dealers. What do we do? The blockchain interest group, the Bitcoin interest group, sorry, at JP Morgan went, what if we market this as blockchain? That's the actual history. So that's why blockchain promotion tends to be the same as Bitcoin promotion or other crypto promotion. They just change the buzzword every few years, like literally the same promises. Um, this technology sort of can be used for things, but only if it's not called blockchain, because like Bitcoin, blockchain, crypto, NFTs, and so on, these are all essentially promises you can get something for free when you can't, and using technology as the sort of excuse to make an impossible promise. Um, as actual technologies, they're laughably ill-suited to the job because, of course, you need to edit stuff. Um, in countries with the GDPR, which the UK is still one, putting personal data on these things is laughably illegal. Like, how do you redact a blockchain? You don't. What happens if you put personal information on it? You're in trouble. Um, it's just, it is so stupid an idea that people try to think of a way to make sense of this bad idea because it's obviously too dumb the way it's presented. 
But, you know, I bothered reading the white papers, looking at the things and so on. And I can tell you, they're almost all exactly as dumb as they look. Mm. Thank you, David. Um, let's, go, let's go back to the second, second question there on f f crypto functioning as a currency or indeed crypto not functioning as a currency and what that means for the kind of integrity of the vision of Web3. Because I, I know you've, you've spoken about this a bit before. So crypto is not a homogeneous space. There's like a wide variety of financial assets that kind of arise out of crypto. And I, they generally fall into kind of two buckets. You have the kind of stable coin assets and then you have the speculative um, coins. So the stable coins are things like the Terra one that exploded last week, um, Tether, which has a certain notoriety to it. Um, and these ones basically try to be kind of a medium of exchange that kind of looks like an unregulated bank or like a money market mutual fund. So it's basically a pool of assets that basically by accounting tricks kind of give rise to a currency which is pegged to like a dollar, right? Um, so those allegedly kind of, if you squint hard enough, they kind of look like public money, except they're kind of public money with this extreme amount of risk associated with it. So it's strictly worse than money in general. And then you have the speculative assets. These are things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, right? And these are largely traded like as like literally like a stock. Um, you're basically trying to buy low and sell high, except you're trying to buy low and sell high on an asset that has no underlying value, right? Because it's like the financialization of nothingness, right? It's basically a product like, like if you go to the British Museum, there's this like um, certificates from the 17th century in like the South Sea Company, which was this notorious bubble right here in Britain back when we were first discovering how to build markets and build securities. Um, mm -hmm where people would start financializing um, these ventures that would happen to be like, you know, voyages to do trade abroad. And um, notoriously, people started creating um, shares in companies that didn't really actually do anything. Um, and it turns out the public will just trade these things anyways. Because of the, the promise, because of the vision yeah. for the future, right. So you can go to the British Museum and see like the first cryptocurrency, and it's like the South Sea <laughs> Company shares all the way back in 1700. Yeah. And nothing has changed, right? People will do exactly the same thing today. and. Unfortunately, those two things, um, money and speculative assets, are diametric opposites, right? You want money to basically have a very predictable inflation rate so you can do things like write loans in it, right? Make mortgages, like project the time value of money so you can do productive enterprise today. And speculative assets, you want price appreciation. You want them to go up. Those are opposite things, mm -hmm. right? And Bitcoin <laughs> is absolutely rubbish as being a money, right? Because it is so wildly speculative because it's untethered to any real economic activity. Right, so it will never function as money. So, so that, that, yeah, right. So that's an important thing: the the connection to an underlying form of activity that people would widely agree was like useful, right? Um, whether it's pr producing food or educating kids or building infrastructure and stuff, we're talking about something that's basically it doesn't rest on any of that. It's it's resting more on the stuff we've been talking about, the marketing layer, right? The, the vision for the future. It's a um, purely narrative-driven asset. Right. So um, that whole world is kind of, I'd love to come to both of you, that, that whole world is kind of in flames at the moment. Um, and uh, Siddharth, you've, um, you've been covering kind of a lot of the crash recently, looking at um, Tether, looking at the function of stable coins and things. Um, th I've come across the idea that this is just a speed bump on the way to something that's inevitable in the future. What's your two cents, right, on why people will keep saying that? They'll keep saying, oh, well, this volatility, this stuff, like, it's just a speed bump, it's just an obstacle in the way, oh, it's a phase that we have to get through to get to the, the promised land. I think it's exactly what Stephen was saying about it being purely narrative driven. I think David as well. You know, people really, if if you're, um, if you've invested a lot of money, and a lot of people do put in a lot of money um, because they're told they buy into a promise like um, a coin like, I'm just going to find Safe Moon, which mm. very name implies, you know, safe way to the moon. You know, you're going to make a lot of money there, and then you have, you know, even I just look at the subreddit there, and, and you'll have constant sort of bad news coming out. People who are leads in the project will disappear. They'll say, we're going off to college now. We didn't actually have any technical skills, but you'll have this constant need to police any negative thought within the community because there is the fear that um, fear is contagion, it'll spread. Um, and you know, Binance's CEO, uh, CZ, 
had a great tweet, which is like, if anybody has FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which is kind of the, the, the three words you don't want to hear in crypto, uh, you should stay away from them. Just avoid uh. bad thoughts, which is um, just terrifying. You know, it's not yeah. a way to live life, is it? And you, you, yeah, you can't live, yeah, you can't live your life with your finger constantly mm. on the, the uh, block button or mute button, yeah. uh, and it doesn't stop prices from crashing. It just keeps you insulated from um, from alternative yeah. views, which are maybe more realistic. I'm, I'm really interested in that that view and the way it aligns with what Joffrey was saying about once you're sort of in it, you have this growing incentive to self censor. Like if you've if you found yourself as part of a crypto group or an NFT community, like you can become increasingly aware of the problem, the problems that we're talking about, but feel like you can't talk about it. Um, Tomini, what, what, what do you think? Hi. Um, so I come into this as, as a pretty much a, a lay person. I think most of what I know about NFTs and crypto is from Dan Olson's video, like two hour long video that he did. Um, but I have sort of two questions as it relates to Web3 that I've written on my phone. <laughs> um, so the first is, can you be anti-Web3 but pro crypto and NFTs, is there like a separation between the two or do the, I, I mean, I'm sure the communities merge, but are there people mm. who are like Web3 is BS, but actually I still believe in crypto and NFTs and how that all works. Mm. And what is the difference between Web3 and the metaverse existing as something that people spend crypto money in and they sell their NFTs in yeah. and they live virtually and digitally. How did the two differentiate? Because it feels like the utopia that is Web3 or that is the metaverse can't really exist when there are so many holes in those f like elements of it mm. that are web that are crypto and that are NFTs. Yeah. And that majority of ordinary people, for want of a better word, haven't bought into those things anyway. Most yeah. people don't have crypto or don't have a lot of crypto or aren't part of the community that you see on Twitter and online. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the two Brilliant questions question. that I have are yeah. the difference between those concepts and can yeah. you be one or the other? Yeah, I, I, I think it's an excellent question. Um, and I also like the other one, which is like, can you be pro Web3 and not believe in any of the things that I've sort of been thinking of as pillars yeah. that hold it up? Um, David, what, like, what, what do you think? Like, are, is, there, is, there a, is there a justification for Web3 in its kind of most abstracted sense without <laughs> NFTs, cryptos, DAOs, that like, what do you think? I think that even if we had the vision of Web3, it would really suck because it would mean the nickel and diming of every single action and breath and fart you take. And I think that would be bad and most people would hate it, you know. Um, but really, you shouldn't be surprised that I think that all of this is literally the same thing. Because mm. you can tell it's all the same thing, by the way, by the fact that it's all marketed in the same venues by the same people using the same hype and most of these people have been selling this stuff for years. It is all part of the same crypto casino. It's all excuses to keep the casino going for the speculators and to lure in new speculators. All of it, it's all the same thing. It sounds like nonsense precisely because those bits are nonsense yeah. is the short answer. So, I mean... I th sorry, sorry, please go on, David. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I mean, that's basically the short answer. Yeah. So I, this feels like a decent time to turn to a slightly different question, but one that's obviously like in this idea of making sense of Web3, which is like, what's going to happen? Um, because it's quite, I mean, there's this huge body of work now that is on the skeptical side. And there's this huge body of evidence for people who've lost their homes, their jobs, uh, their children they've lost their or they've, they've damaged their mental health um seb my colleague and i had th just this really striking conversation with um someone in el salvador um a few weeks ago 
on just how woefully dysfunctional Bitcoin was for all of the promises that its authoritarian, that their authoritarian dictator had made to the people. Um, so I'm, I'm left thinking like, okay, if, if we're kind of aligned in this, um, how, how do you reach people who are kind of just wildly on the other side of the fence? Um, and indeed, like, is there a way of like conceptualizing the future of the internet as something that's like, let's tackle the actual harms and issues that are very pre present now rather than peddling this like future, this vision. Um, I wonder if I could just put that question to you guys, like Stephen, like what do you think can happen now to reconcile the views that people have? I think it goes back to a single observation is that not all innovation is unqualifiedly good, right? There are many things that we can build that we probably should not. Like mm. we can build Instagram for kids, but probably it's a bad idea, right? And if you look at all of crypto, mm. right, you have to ask a fundamental question. What does this exist to do? Yes, we can have a world in which we have 19,000 different types of private money. Is that a world you want to live in? Probably not. We can financialize nothingness. Okay, is that a world that really leads to good outcomes? Not particularly. We've tried that before, right? Mm. Do we want to have completely unregulated laissez-faire markets where everybody can get screwed all the time? We've tried that too. It also sucks. So, I mean, everything that crypto tries to do basically manifests in this kind of like Dickensian hellscape, right? And so maybe when we're looking here from the future, say like maybe we don't want to go down that path mm. and maybe this stuff really isn't actually going anywhere good. And maybe we should have some fundamental like reassessments about like, what actually is the purpose of any of this stuff? Because we're having this whole sense-making conversation about something that nobody in this room can even define. Right. 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 That's the fundamental truth here, right? Charles. My actual understanding is that this stuff doesn't get beyond web one, if at all. But if I can play devil's advocate for one second, uh, is it not the case that the advocates of crypto say there's an inherent value in it? in it being a non-fiat currency, unpegged to any national government. Let's just suppose that Trump gets back in, right? American democracy melts down, uh, and with it, the Amer <laughs> and, w and with it, the status of the dollar as the world's um, reserve currency, uh, and she steps up and says, that's okay, you can use the yuan, but people don't want to use the Chinese currency. Is there then, a legitimate role for crypto. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, sure. Stephen. Um, yeah, no, because Bitcoin can't function as money, right? You can't use it as a medium of exchange because it's too volatile because it's not tethered to economic activity. It's not backed by the full faith and credit of like the British state or the US Treasury, right? People that try to use it like they did in El Salvador, it ends in disaster. Right? So this stuff is not built for purpose. It cannot function as money because there is fundamental economic problems at the heart of it. So no, in, even in some sort of like dystopian future where there's the collapse of the dollar, no, something like the dollar would arise because like this is a system that works to facilitate economies. And like, unfortunately, fiat money is the worst system that's been tried except for everything else, right? Yeah. Just like Winston Churchill said, right? Fiat money works because the state backs it. And there's a singular truth is that money exists to extinguish your obligations to the state, right? And that gives rise to basically a system by which you know, people have to acquire money in order to extinguish their obligations, right? And there's a central bank that issues it, and through you know, monetary policy and you know, adjusting bank lending rates, we have a system that is remarkably stable. We can do inflation targeting, we can write loans, and then this gives rise to the entire edifice that all of modern capitalism exists on. And this system works very well, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. I'm sorry, but the dollar is here to stay for a very long time, because even if there was some political unrest in the United States, right? you know, the euro or like other fiat systems would arise because this is a system that works better than anything else. And crypto has no answer to how to build money because it lacks one thing, a central issuer and a state to back it. You cannot have money without uh, tethering it to like, you know, an institution and a state because money is a social construction. It's part of the social contract of Britain, the pound. Yeah, but so, sorry, I'll come to you in a second. Um, it's, it's worth pulling that thread a little bit more though, I think, because part of, or I guess, aligned with that question, Giles, is the one of like, 
is dissatisfaction with central banking, with uh, the global financial system, something that's driving uh, an attraction to cryptocurrency. And I think that's undeniably true, right? Like part of the, the marketing narrative we've been talking about is an escape from the inherently corrupt and inherently exploitative and ineffective global financial system. But there's a big um, th throwing the uh, baby out with the bathwater problem there, right? If you get rid, as you were just describing, Stephen. Yeah, I mean, you can criticize like all of capitalism for kind of the corruption we have, but like that doesn't arise out of monetary policy. That arises out of external things to monetary policy, right? So I think it's a bit reductive to say that like all of the problems we see with the kind of exploitive like the financial crises and things arise out of monetary policy. No, monetary policy is what facilitates you know economic enterprises, and from that arises some corruption that we see. But like. Yeah. Ultimately, that's always going to exist in capitalism, and this is just the system we have to do. And what, the question we have to ask is like, how do we best manage um, our economy in a way that like gives rise to equity and equality and spurs economic growth? And unfortunately, cryptocurrency has no answer to any of that because it doesn't actually function as money. Yeah. All it is is financialization of nothingness. Yeah. Um, hi, have you got a mic? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think actually my question was kind of just answered within that but well, I tell think, us what it was yeah. well so it was kind of a bit, sort of adding on to Giles's point of people who don't feel like they're represented by the central bank or the IMF or um sort of who I mean we still use things like GDP which is often sort of touted as this completely outdated model that doesn't really look at a sort of modern look at what the economy is because there's so much of it certainly like a lot of mm. like women's time and labor isn't counted within that and so I'm not saying crypto is the answer, but what if a state did back it? I know El Salvador, I mean, I don't know enough. I'm very much beyond, I'm like so amateur, it's like lower than layman. But what if a state said, do you know what, I've had enough of this international system. I'm gonna back crypto within our own community. That's how we're gonna use it. And we don't care about the IMF, about the central bank. Mm. We're just gonna do our own thing. Is that even possible? Is that something that could be done? Or are we too, are we at a stage now where we're too interconnected that crypto couldn't ever be a sort of yeah. singular country's sort of, I don't know, middle finger to, to the rest of currency? Interesting. So you have a microphone over, over here. I'd just like to add, to be part of the global economy, you have to be part of the global economy. So if they did a cryptocurrency that didn't want to be part of the global economy, you turn into Russia. What do you think? I mean, fair point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there, but, there but is within Russia, I don't know, I mean, I don't know that many, well, I know one Russian person who left Russia, but um, yeah, I don't, where, within their communities, is that something that could be a, I don't know, a potential for sort of some kind of anarchist revolution is this like the next phase of that i don't know yeah i feel like I've, i've taken it sometimes it's such a weird turn but like is that is, is that what is that now where crypto belongs have we said well it doesn't really work for states but does it work for people who don't like our current state system yeah most people just want to burn it all down instead of trying to fix the current system and that's exactly the problem they yeah. should be looking at the current system trying to get the right politicians that represent us to fix and regulate better the banks instead of burning it all down. I totally agree. I just thought it was oh, yeah. a... Mm. <laughs> uh, did, you, did you want to speak? I was just going to ask, like, I guess, the difference between then... And, so the European Central Bank, for example, and the Bank of England are investing in crypto, but are they actually trying to build a digital currency rather than crypto? Mm -hmm. like, what are, what, so is that then still pegged to a real currency? So like what Bank of England is doing and what like um, the Federal Reserve in the United States are experimenting with is called a central bank digital currency. Mm -hmm. So the key word there is central, yeah. okay? So this is basically a way of digitizing the central bank's balance sheet. Okay, it fine. has nothing to do with cryptocurrency and I can't let's rest this enough, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right, it may share some of the same kind of like technological underpinnings, but like you have a central issuer. Yeah. Um, and so like the characteristics of it is like a digital pound much like what you already have with your kind of bank deposits, but in a slightly different form. And so like people like to say that central bank digital currencies are like cryptocurrencies, but they share absolutely none of the same properties. Okay. CBDCs are a big debate in FinReg about whether they're a good idea or not, 
but they're kind of an experiment that will be floating out for the next 10 years or so. And is that to try and counter some of the issues like you need a permanent address or three months of energy statements or whatever to set up a bank account, which is, I imagine, why some people invest in crypto because they're like, I can't get a bank account in this country or this area because I don't have a stable address or a stable income or whatever. So I'm, is it trying to address those issues or is it just not? No, the CBDC, mind just being utopian? if it were actually implemented, would largely be kind of like a interbank settlement system. So oh, okay. what you're talking about is like know your customer requirements, yeah. which is the thing you have to do when you go up to the bank and say, oh, I'm gonna bring two utility dresses, yeah, you yeah. know, and like bring all that stuff. Um, a CBDC wouldn't really fix that. Um, that's a matter of the regulation that exists around opening up bank accounts, and that's largely detached from technical underpinnings of like how money moves around the banks. Okay. Um, so two different things. But thank you. I, I'd love I'd love to um, just uh, conscious that we're going to have to finish it in a moment. Um, I'd love to go back to to Joffrey with kind of a similar question to one I put to you a moment ago, Stephen, which is like, what uh, it's perhaps more interesting, Joffrey, actually to ask you, like, what are you going to do next? <laughs> um, if you can tell us. Um, I'm just really, really watching, watching the space because it, it, it's so weird. Uh, there's these promises of, um, of a future that never seems to be there. I, I saw it in, in some of the questions. Is there a use for this? Like, could we use it here? And that seems to be the, the, the kind of the narrative that's always like it's early days. Um, if I look at like an iPhone that's been around for like 13 years now, crypto has been around for about 13 years now. iPhones really changed the world. But for some reason, we have the cryptocurrency and now this Web3, it's, uh, it still hasn't. We're still searching for a use case. And like if people are trying to search for a way of usage. Um, as for myself, um, I'm not planning anything in particular with NFTs. I'm a little bit concerned about them. I reckon people should go look at um, a blog post by Molly White called mm -hmm. Abuse on the Blockchain. Um, just because it's uh, uh, right now an NFT is artwork. It's just like the second it's art. But it, could be, it could be images, right? It could be imagery. Um, and uh, Molly goes into that into a blog post where uh, it, could be, it could be quite bad because um, essentially what's been created in this NFT world is, well, there's no permission to receive an NFT. Like you can actually create an NFT and then just send it to someone, just quite like email. But unlike email, um, there's no real way to delete it because the blockchain's permanent. Now, what does that mean? Um, like there are there are things that are like, course, like burning a token or destroying, et cetera. But we enter into a, an area that's really super strange where someone can send an abusive NFT to your wallet and then your wallet is connected to your social media account and the social media account automatically displays that NFT that you did not consent to. Um, definitely go look at some of the things that Molly's doing and for abuse and harassment of the blockchain. There's a lot that we haven't thought about. Um, to answer one of the uh, questions that came up, no, Web3 cannot exist without cryptocurrency because it requires a reward function to work. Um, Web3, if you look at it, there's a website I created called welcome to web 3com And it's a simulation of using social media. The way, the best way to look at Web3 is every time you do an operation, such as uploading a photo or posting a tweet, it costs money to use. Now, if we're going to build a new internet, as they say, using Web3, what does that mean for the world where you can only use the internet if you've got money? Um, and if, if we can't answer that question why are we even building right because we've already got a perfectly functioning internet where anyone can use it um and there's all these false narratives saying that web3 is meant to uh, destroy facebook etc but essentially what's happening is the uh, companies uh that they're saying that it's gonna like it's all decentralized but the companies that are coming in to replace and fill in the gaps of Web3 because it's, it's not great technology. Um, they're creating new centralized energies with, uh, well, uh, less accountable um, because they're all anonymous. Yeah. Thanks, Geoffrey. Um, the little flag has gone up, and I, I would love to um, just get kind of your final thoughts, David, and maybe put a question to you that's 
I guess, similar or a hybrid of the one I asked Stephen and Joffrey, like, what, it, what are you planning next? And like, where do you think you're most effective in, I guess, first of all, making sense of this, as you, we, you have been doing for some time, but also like, where does your kind of, where, where do you take this, where you think this is ethically the things that we should be saying and advising on this subject? Because I think us as a newsroom, I, I've definitely become frustrated reading content concerned with Web3 and crypto and learning later that actually the author is someone who holds 10 grand's worth of Bitcoin. Or indeed, see, see, seeing this content come out where you can see that the allusion to the fact that, oh, well, maybe this is the inevitable future, and oh, maybe this is going to be fantastic. And you learn that actually it's a company that hosts an annual cryptocurrency summit where they're all just boosting. So I'd, I'd love to know kind of your reflections on that fact that we see so much of this affecting what we should think and say and do, and, and also learn what you're, what you're planning. So we got a room full of people in there who are interested because they hear about this so much, but they don't really understand how it works. The very quick way is all the complicated stuff that you don't quite understand, that's all chaff thrown up to try to get you to buy into nonsense. The idea that somehow money is different now, it's a whole new paradigm, we can all get rich, everything will be magic, and it'll be brilliant. There are problems in the world. We'll supply some magic. So the first point is magic doesn't happen. Two and two makes four. It doesn't make five, six, ten, or a million. It makes four. If it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. If you've got someone promising to double your money, they want to pick your pocket. If you've got someone offering 20% interest rates, they want to pick your pocket. If someone's promising a fabulous new future and all you have to do is give them your money, maybe you should look into it a bit more closely or just think, no, I can do without that and get on with my life. If you want to fix your personal circumstances, crypto, you can totally get rich in crypto, right? You can also get rich betting on horses. It's not investment on the, on the individual level. It's a gamble. Treat it as a gamble. If you want, think you want to become a crypto trader, you're diving into a shark pool built by the sharks to feed the sharks. So trade carefully. Um, magic doesn't happen. And you need to watch out because this space is full of predators who want your money. Yeah. None of this has changed in centuries. I often say the best book about Bitcoin is Extraordinary Popular Delusions by Charles Mackay. That was written in 1841 about the South Sea bubble, which Stephen mentioned about the tulip bubble in Holland, uh, John Law's scheme in Missouri, all of these asset bubbles, and irrational exuberance. Um, it's because some people really, really, they feel desperate. They don't understand stuff. They think maybe this is a way out. But whenever you hear people saying new paradigm, money is different now, they want to pick your pocket. Mm. You can go a long way just on common sense that magic doesn't happen. And if it looks magical, magic doesn't happen. That's basically the short answer. And we need to be concerned because this these people are scammers. Yeah. They're out there skinning mums and dads and grannies and young people who are desperate. They're desperate. And these people are preying on them. And that is reprehensible. And we have to stand up and say that. You know, yeah. that that is what the media needs to do and what it doesn't do. Like the shine came off the crypto bubble just recently. You got all these papers running features. Hmm, crypto, maybe it's not so good after all. These are the same papers who are running articles a month ago saying how great it was and you should totally get in. You know, where were you a month ago, guys? They have really lost sight of the public interest here. And the public interest is making sure the public isn't scammed by predators. That's Thanks. the short answer to what the media should do. Thanks, David. Um we're, we're at the end, and um, I'm happy about the outcome of this as a thing that was trying to make sense, and not least because I, I think you both actually, David and Stephen, used the term like there's been a grand failure of sense making around this subject that, that, that has led to the problem that David's just very, um, very uh, convincingly described. Um, I think there was something also very interesting in the idea that 
Web3 for many people is a Rorschach test. Like whatever you see will be if all you're dealing with is a vision for the future and you never actually have to build any verifiable technology. Um, letting aside whether you can prove that, that that thing you've built is doing harm or more harm than good. Um, I'm gonna keep circling back to what's going on in El Salvador, I think, um, because it feels like the best test bed for some of the claims about Web3 and crypto as a way of running a society and as a, as a legitimate future, and it just seems to be going terribly. Um, so we, I think, as tortoise, ought to be treating crypto as a casino in the way that we think, write, discuss, advocate about it. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I hope we'll leave with a better sense of what Web3 supposedly is going to be and a, a much more pointed sense of skepticism about it. Um, I can't say it any better than David just did, so thanks for joining us, um, and I hope we'll see you again soon.